All right, all right. Keep continue. All right, all right. Cold open, cold open, cold open. So, um, so let's start with the conversation that if you go, if Agile Twitter is to be believed, or if Agile LinkedIn is to be believed, two, you want to talk about a wretched hive of scum and villainy, right? Like the Moss Eisley Cantina, both those places, I think they're uh -huh, fast uh -huh. parables. But if Brought the next start. Yeah, here we go. Unemployable, the two of us. Um, if if we're if that narrative is to be believed, that narrative is saying that Agile is dead or Agile is dying or Agile is this and Agile is that. And, and it's it's almost a doom and gloom type outlook. And while I can be a cynic, uh, I am probably the most cynical optimist most people will meet in their lives. Mm. But I don't necessarily think it's that bad. I think the world is changing and what we're seeing is a lot of the the consternation around that? Uh, maybe. I, 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 let me say this. I think uh, the rise in unemployed agilists might be mm -hmm. the reason why the temperature is getting turned up in. Plus, I mean, again, I know you love, I know you love Cliff and our Agile 2 brethren. Love um, is a, hold on before you finish that statement. Love is a strong word. I, well, I, don't, right. I don't love you much have a, of anything. You have a better appreciation so, for their. You have a better appreciation for their work than I. Fair do. enough. Uh, fair um, enough. They are. They are turning the dial. So all the pessimism. I have seen some comments and some quotes and such from them recently that they are also are turning the volume up. And um, also I, another thing I've noticed, like. I think people have just said everything, every crappy thing they can think of about safe to this point in time. And now they're starting to turn the dial back towards scrum. Have you, have you noticed that there is a bit of pessimism in, uh, you know, about the merits of, I think I like just, I, I just think the negativity dial is being turned up a bit. And I, it's, you know, is that, is that fair? No, that's that's completely fair, completely spot and on. And the atmosphere and I mean, is causing some of it. I mean, there's a lot of people, it, me included, that have time to yeah. navel gaze these days. You know what I mean? It's it's a recursive, almost the monster is feeding itself. It's an or Ouroboros, Ouroboros, whatever, the snake that eats its own tail, right? That's really what it's become, is is we're putting into the zeitgeist. Good God. I um we're oh putting into. I got to be very careful what I say on this podcast. <laughs> well, we're, put, we're putting out into the culture. So we're going to pivot to the topic in a second. But we're and, and it's actually relevant to the topic, which is why we started recording with a cold yes. open. Um, we're by saying these things publicly, we kind of re, we get into that ring of negative reinforcement, and it's. I mean, we could sit here. We could do a whole other episode on just the the reflecting about you know we're twenty years into this thing called agile. Where is it going? You know, where has it been? Where is it going? What mistakes were made? What did we actually learn so we oh. don't do it again? And that would be that would be an interesting topic for another time, I think. No, I well, we're gonna talk about it when we we're gonna talk about it with this book because um yes yes history like, history let's just, get into, yeah. let's just yeah. get into it like so I, like so, i'm dying like we're gonna touch on the doom and gloom of agile all throughout tonight's podcast like just because uh, there is some there are some lessons to be learned from this this uh pamphlet if it will. is a pamphlet so uh we're, we're 10 minutes in we've yet to talk about the topic at hand so this week's episode Chris and I did some Can you homework. say welcome to Agile Uprising Podcast? Hey, you hey, haven't hey. even said where yeah, we are. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Agile <laughs> Uprising Podcast. I'm your host, I do this all the time. With me is my partner in crime, Chris Merman. Say hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. All right, I knew that was coming. So what are we talking about this week? So what we're doing is we're actually going to turn the clock back. Merman and I did a little bit of homework. And we the title of this episode, unless we go talk, totally off the reservation, uh, the title of this episode is going to be In Defense of Taylorism. So what Merman and I did is we actually hold purchased, on. Hold, hold on. on, we purchased a copy of the Principles of Scientific Management written by Frederick Winslow Taylor. And we're Back actually going to see, we're actually going to talk through some of the salient points because um, it's one of those things that everybody loves to bag on. Every Agilist will shit on Waterfall, aka Critical Change, till the cows come home. But 
I think in this, and this is where it goes back to where we start our moment, in this time of reflection where we're starting to look back and see what we did well and what didn't go well, retrospect on our actual industry, it helps to go and take a look at some of the things that came before us because we might have lost some stuff in translation. But go on, you were going to say something. Oh, no, I make no mistake about it. I, I, am, I am going to back on this book uh, a plenty in this podcast. So I, you, you are defending Taylorism. I am defending some of this book. Well, let's get I, it. Like, can we just say this? How many people that make fun of Taylorism haven't read a word of this text? No, I would say it's, a, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make an analogy. Taylorism and the principles of scientific management, people <laughs> shitting on that, the analogy on the other side of the double colon is people talking about Reinertson. Everybody shits on Taylorism. Nobody's read the book. Everybody quotes Don Reinertson. Nobody's read the book. So, uh, now, one's a positive message and one's a negative message, but it's one of those things where unless you actually took the time to go back and read and do your homework. And I do think it is important because it is a lot of it is cut. To, it's it's the cornerstone to why we do what we do. It's the it's the the yin to the yang. No, I don't think most people have read it. And let's be honest, it's not an it's not necessarily an easy read. Okay, okay, all right. I am glad you started with that an easy read. Um, like there's I I've I make notes in here about it. Like I. I I think it's interesting to read the way that people like the educated folk, right? Because I mean, Taylor represents yeah. the educated folk of a century ago. Like this book is was written in what year again, Jay? 1911. Okay. All right. So Taylor was, he he wasn't just like, uh, like let's set the context of who mr frederick taylor is like i mean this is what's going on in 1911 jay like we've so like, this is has the this, first world war even been fought mm -mm. no i think the first world war is what 15 to 18 and now i'm going to get flamed in the comments for not knowing when <laughs> world war one started but no at this point um World War One has not started yet in 1911. It started in 1914. July 28, 1914 go. was, uh, yeah. you know, the assassination of Franz yeah. Ferdinand um, by Gavrilo Princip, who actually died of typhus, I think, in prison. Um, so at this point, that hasn't happened yet. But there is some sense you have seen the Industrial Revolution. You have seen the rise of the mechanical age. To right. your point about the history of, of Mr. Taylor, uh, he was a consultant working at Bethlehem Steel. There we right? go. Um, there we go. And, I'm, and and he was his roommate was William Gant, which is kind of funny in its own right. But yep. so the the first thing that I picked out he most, might be the first famous uh, management consultant. Probably, yeah, yes, yeah. I would argue yes. Uh, there's got to be somebody in like ancient Rome. I don't know. Maybe mm. maybe uh, what's his? Who was the angry guy? Who would who Diogenes? Right. He was a management consultant because he would just yell at people. Um, I let, let's just say this. We've not seen documentation of, of of a consultant of Mr. Taylor's and Mr. Gantz uh, uh, bereft uh, before then. Like, yes, I don't yes. know that they, we, yes. we you could easily look at this book as the first published work of a modern management consultant yes yes and so the so let's take it full circle and talk about how we as agilists typically reject the idea of scientific management wholesale on its face we say it's it's command and control command and control which there is a lot of it which we're going to get into but the interesting thing and we you know talking about looking backwards in order to understand what's going to go forwards the the reason why taylor read the charge to standardization and the, and some of his work was because they were combating the way that problems were typically solved back then before the idea of standardization. And the title was, it was called Initiative and Incentive. So incent people and give them the space and the, let them have the initiative to solve the problems. Now, Chris, if we're going to turn the mic, the mirror back on our practice and what we do, that there are some 
historical echoes to the idea of initiative and incentive that maybe we have um, taken too far to the extreme, I will say, but there are definitely some echoes. Oh, no, the, the number of times, Jay, I made the note in here of we might not have learned much no, we, in a century and we a have half. It. like in i mean again 1911 <laughs> it is currently 2023 we're talking more than a century and a decade mm-hmm. we haven't learned anything we just you will re- you repeating. like they're, they're the notes i made in here jay the 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 times that they say in here all right so like now let me start with one of my very first highlights. This is on page four. The principal object of management should be to secure the maximum prosperity for the employer coupled with the maximum prosperity for each employee, right? Like, right. So again, again, like, has anybody actually read this? Like, he starts with something that I think everybody agrees with mm-hmm. or should agree with. Yes. I mean, do you really think if you read this to any current manager right here, that quote that I just read you, how many do you think actually agree with that statement? Uh, I mean, it's very altruistic. Uh, how many people do you think that a manager actually does this? Well, they publicly, so there's a difference between what they publicly acknowledge and what they think in private. No, I'm I'm sorry. There is a difference between what people publicly say they support and what their actions prove that they support. I think in a mixed meeting, you would have people say, well, of course, of course, we want our people to be successful. We want the company to be successful. But I think there are a, a rather, might be small, but a large contingent inside each enterprise that is truly based maximum prosperity, i.e., let's put the modern lens on it, profitability of the employer, right? And and no matter how much harping we can do from the top of the mountain about how we need to put employees first and the Daniel Pink stuff, at the end of the day, there is a large contingent that we're always going to be, that's, that is always going to be the tide that we're swimming against. You could you could make the argument that the managers that he spoke to for his research of this again. So this, I mean, this work, the his research happened way before he wrote this. I mean, mm-hmm. you, I, I would I you could argue that the research that he did for this was done in the 19 aughts. Yeah, well, like, it definitely was. It absolutely was. Yeah, and the managers that he worked with to do this research i bet you like argued with this statement just as much as you probably would think that managers behavior now argues with this statement you know what i mean agreed agreed like seriously the goal is to to i mean to truly live the the life of what management is right Mm -hmm. I care about my people and I care about the profit of my company. Like, right. I, I think managers still struggle with this. Well, and so to add on to your statement, right. So uh, where is it? Prosperity for the employee coupled with prosperity for the employer, right? That's the primary motivator. But when he goes into detail and and if you think about it, now that we're moving into the industrial age, historically, we're moving past, Mm -hmm. You know, you being a baker, me being an iron worker, and I shoe your horses and you give me bread, right? Um, with the introduction of the industrial age, you introduce the concept of an actual manager. And he calls out the primary motivation is for the company to make money. It is for the workmen to make money. The manager's role is the managers to help the workmen make money, which makes the company money, right? So I'm going to dovetail that with another statement. I'm going to read it verbatim from later in the book. Almost, quote, almost every act of the workman should be preceded by one or more preparatory acts of management, which will enable him to do his work better and quicker than he otherwise could. So that is, I mean, here is servant leadership 
1911. If you want to go all the way back 1911 years, the ideal servant leader was Jesus Christ. Then again, we can talk about what happened to him. Maybe not a best example for servant leadership, but I digress. But, but Marvin, here we go. He's talking about the role of a good manager is to support your people and help them be successful, which will support the company. And, and I'm not saying that everybody believes into it. I, there were definitely people sitting there going, Bruh. as Taylor is, he's off his rocker. You know, no, no, no. I mean, but it, like the development of the again, he says that he the development of every branch of the business to its highest state of excellence so that the prosperity may be permanent. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like everybody gets behind that. Every, everybody, everybody can get behind that. Hey, if we help the company make money, then they'll give us more money. Like no like I, the number of times i wrote in the margins of this book and i say wrote <laughs> because it's a digital i wrote i have the kindle version of this but i mean the number of times i wrote no shit sherlock well i i, I wrote those words no shit sherlock right and back then it was completely transformative because no one was thinking in that way everything was bespoke and the way, and he does, we didn't, I don't think we took any notes when, I, and when we looked at the show notes. Um, there is a giant chunk where they talk about the history of guilds and how typically knowledge and problems were passed down verbally by practice through tradesmen, the apprentice and the master through generation and generation and generation, where there was no, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal a Bushism. There were, we need to consistify these processes. Uh, there wasn't any of that. There wasn't even the idea of that. And that's, I think that's the, the, that's the hill that that Taylor was prepared to die on, that if you find some coherence and some consistency in your process, there is now we're going to go back to the other consultant speak, right? Economies of scale and speed to market and all that. It's all there. But back then, nobody was thinking about this. And if you look at his historically, my argument is I will defend the guy because he had these ideas which have influenced what we do now. But through the years, they've been it's like a game of telephone that's ended up – it's like a game of telephone we played as kids. He said one thing, and now we're, like you said, 100 years and a decade in, and we're still trying to figure out what servant leadership is. We're still trying to figure out how you, we need to incent people. Hey, the, he, he, so a couple of pages later, Jay, he talks about how we've been – We've been up, you know, we've been leading people and uh, with basically rule of thumb. I mean, he talks, he calls out the rule of thumb was our, was, you know, prior to his, this writing, like we basically said, you will be successful if you follow this rule of thumb, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, you, you could argue that the rule of thumb is in many, many of our conversations at work today, like the rule of thumb is still followed. Like, mm -hmm. th th think about that. I mean, those of you who are ready to uh, take a pitchfork to Mr. Taylor and his work, like, we still struggle with following the rule of thumb, you know? Mm -hmm. You, um, you know, you, um, <laughs> you, fe you know, you feature branchers, you, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, yep. th there are still there are still coding practices that are followed off of not the current best practice. Nope. I mean, many of you work on applications that are like to call it like the legacy, the legacy branches, the legacy branches, air quotes of the way that we work mm -hmm. are still sort of kind of based off the rule of thumb, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would love to, I would love to do trunk based development, uh, uh, Mr. Merman. We would love to do that in a perfect world. We would all be, we would all be doing trunk based development. That ain't the way that my uh, legacy application still gets to do. Any of you that work in the telecommunications industry, mm -hmm. any of you based in the government space, and the number of the number of government applications that run this country would frighten you, your yeah. faithful listener. It's yeah, dear it's, heart. It's like, like anybody. We, um, anybody we, who's go on, go on. 
No, 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 no. Go, cut I was me just off. Saying, I'm just saying, like, we're still, we're still having these problems. Anybody who's ever spent any time in a teleco or a cable provider knows that it's a minor miracle when you hit that button and the cable box actually goes on. It's a minor miracle. Um, so before we before we go into a little bit more of the content, um, I know there's people probably who are screaming at the head unit or their, their cell phone already saying, but but this is all scientific management comes from mechanical processes. It's not the same as software. It's not the same as software. To which I would reply, no, you're wrong. Um, there is a giant chunk in this book where Taylor talks about an experiment they did with the idea of cutting metal, right? Cutting sheet metal. Uh, and in a typical station, right? This is way before Toyota and Lean. In a typical station, there was something like 12 different attributes that you can control. The size of the, the blade, the width of the blade, the speed at which the blade is running, the temperature of the blade, the temperature of the metal, the thickness of the metal, the side of the metal, the cut. Blah, 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 blah. There were 12 different attributes. With if you, if you do the math, it's something like 4,075 possible combinations of changing all those attributes. This study took them 26 years, right? Now, nowadays with the computer, we could probably do it in probably 26 minutes. ChatGPT would probably do it in 26 seconds, right? But my point being is I want to emphasize to the people who think that Taylorism is just about manufacturing. It's just about mechanical engineering, uh, which, by the way, that's where, where Taylor's from. It, it, that doesn't mean it's any less complex than the stuff we deal with day over day. It's just as complex, if not more so, because, you know, when you make a mistake writing code, you just delete it. You lose a couple of minutes. When you make a mistake cutting a one and a half inch piece of sheet metal, there's a substantial dollar amount tied to that, which is a little bit more pricey when it comes to rolling back your problem. So as we were, as we were getting into this, Jay, I was, uh, I was kind of curious. Do you think that there are people that are like, wait, people make fun of this stuff? Like if you could like, let's just take, 45 seconds 45 to 60 seconds and just quickly recap um what the naysayers of taylorism say you're getting into it right now yeah okay um let me, so, let me i'll try like, and wing it let me try and wing give it. them a quick recap let me try and wing it cut me off if i get i get sideways so typically taylor taylor is used as a one-to-one -one comparison to the idea of command and control if you're if you're familiar with the schneider culture model at all uh is looked as a top-down management controls the worker management tells them everything that tells the worker everything that they need to do uh management controls everything the workers are basically just mindless automatons throwing shovels of shit or in this example pig iron right um that is the typical knock on taylorism it's it's used as a um it's like uh what's the word i'm looking at this remember it's 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 like um it's like nowadays how people um refer to other people as woke as an insult we use taylorism as an insult to say oh well that's taylorism that's tayloristic thinking because we're lazy instead of saying well that's a command and control cultural construct it might not have anything to do with mr taylor because he talks about you know the inventiveness of, of laborers later did that did i come close did I go, but mervin you also call out a different point right the fact that if i'm not on agile twitter and i'm not on agile linkedin if i'm just you know just running into agilists in the course of work you may not even hear this dialogue mm, maybe you don't hear this specific dialogue and and the reason why i asked you to kind of recap like why do like why do people make fun of taylor or or and the the um the the word that we have turned this this pamphlet and i say pamphlet because it's only 80 pages like like the 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 tome that all of uh taylorism is based off of is 80 pages right yep um now it trust me there are parts of this you know <laughs> this small tome that tend to i i just i there are parts of it that i'm like yada 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 mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. like trust me like i i have i have i there are several pages that i just kind of flipped through um because he gets deep into the science of his of his research regardless of which that yeah, of, yeah sorry i'm rambling but mm -mm. If you if you are if you are wondering why are people why are you all talking about Taylorism? Because every tweet, every meme, 
every uh, uh, LinkedIn post that you see making fun of, quote, bad managers, right? And for the record, I saw it again the other day, and I made a uh, I, I made a comment based upon it. But anytime you see someone talking about bad managers, bad leadership, like um, this is bad, right? Like all, like all of the command and control, like posts that you see, they are all based off of the scientific management that is written by Frederick Taylor and air quotes Taylorism. So Taylorism is what originated from these 80 pages, 80 ish pages. Mm -hmm. um, and again, none of you all have read it. Yeah. Um, so let me, so while we just talked about, we talked about the knock on Taylorism. So let's talk about the four, uh, the, the four or five principles, principles of scientific management. And um, keep, I would ask all of our listeners, keep the Agile Manifesto in mind as I rattle these off. Taylor himself summarizes scientific management as science, not rule of thumb, harmony, not discord, cooperation, not individualism, maximum output in place of restricted output. We're going to go back to that one. And lastly, the development of each man to his greatest efficiency and prosperity. Prosperity. Right. None of those are completely counter. None of those spit right in the face of the Azure Manifesto. The fourth one, people are going to ask, like, what do you mean maximum output in place of restricted output? Well, the, the observations that, um, and again, this is the start of the industrial age. The observations were that people who were parts of guilds would actually slow down how much they would deliver because they don't want to overexert themselves. Because if they realistically could do, say, 100 widgets a day, and they, they are only doing 60 and everybody's doing 60. They all collude with each other to only do 60. That is what management starts thinking of as, well, this is how many we're just going to get per day. So there was an uh, there was the idea of others making, uh, one person making others look bad by overproducing, overachieving, so on and so forth. Um, and they had a whole bunch of study and science behind it, which I thought was pretty interesting. And we'll talk about some of the experiments they go into later. But that's where maximum output in, pace of, in place of restricted output meant. It means don't just slow yourself down because you don't want to, um, it's not that you don't want to work hard. Or maybe, that, maybe that's the inference people make that they think people didn't want to work hard. It's not that they didn't want to work hard. They wanted to work at a measured pace because I think there was the assumption that the, the whip would come around the corner, the stick instead of the carrot. Yeah, the, he, he also, um, I'm, I'm trying to find the note that I made, Jay, but he also makes a point to call out. So on top of those four principles, there's three basic pieces of evidence that you have utilized scientific management. Do you have those? Do you have those? Uh, I was I'm trying, trying to, to be prepared when you finished that. Um, but there's three basic like outputs. Um, I'm looking now to 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 scientific management, uh, and I'm struggling, and I apologize. And I will tell everyone that's listening: um, this is not an easy book to read because it's written in 1911. So there's a lot of really, really, really big words. And oh, the uh, the four underlying principles. Uh, no, we talked about that. We talked about that already. Um, I know what you're talking about because I can picture it. I just don't remember. That's so. That's okay. That's okay. Keep talking about Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor. I will find that. Okay. Um. So let's, uh, let's talk about some other thing he talked about, which gives him uh, Taylorism gets a bad rap. Is the idea of intelligence and labor. So there's a very famous quote around. Um, the intelligence and or lack thereof of someone who's moving pig iron. Pig iron is raw iron ingots that typically get shoveled off a truck into a wheelbarrow. They go into a smelter, so on and so forth. Um, and he does insult the intelligence of the pig iron workers at one point, but it's in, and that's only if you selectively choose his words, which is kind of like the, the way newscasts work today. If you read, he actually talks about there is a difference in intelligence when it comes to different laborers and the work that they are actually doing. For example, his, in his own experiments, he said there is a different difference of intelligence between someone who is just shoveling pig iron versus someone who is sitting there at a uh, bandsaw or a massive industrial saw cutting sheet metal. He says there is a difference 
And he also explicitly calls out intelligent men will tire of menial work. So again, these are things that we, we think the Taylorism, where we, assi- we assign to Taylorism that, oh, he thinks everybody's stupid, and that's why people are too stupid to self-solve, and well, they, they, they need to be told everything what to do. It's again, not that, yeah. again, management, up until this point in our country's history, before Mr. Taylor's scientific management became, I mean, after this, I mean, really, I mean, management changed after the publication mm-hmm. of this of this book. And I would imagine it did not like catch on. I mean, it was one of those things. It's not like collectively, there was no internet back then. It's not like collectively people said we will start managing differently. But th- I mean, this really, this tome is the, is what the modern principles of management are based off of. Right. And, right. and, and I found, and I found the three, I found the three, um, oh, go for it, go for it. results of it. Right. So, so if you want to, if, if he, he actually repeats this, he was so pre must have been so proud of these three kind of key results. Um, but cause he, he repeats them like after basically every section of, of, of this, of this publication, um, he talks that he says, um, he, he even says to repeat then like he, I mean, he repeats himself so much. It will be seen that the use results, that the use results have hinged mainly upon one, the substitution of science for the individual judgment of the workman. Two, the scientific selection and development of the workman after each man has been studied, taught, and trained. Uh, and that one may be experimented with instead of allowing the workmen to select themselves to develop in a haphazard way. And three, the intimate cooperation of the management with the workmen so that they together do the work in accordance with the scientific laws which would have been developed instead of leaving the solution to each problem in the hands of the individual workmen. So basically, like, if you... If if management, um, if if management introduces science into the conversation, and they 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 work with the you know individual employee, the workman, as it's called. Um, again, this was written in 1911, so there is a lot that will be seen as very sexist that he says in this book. But that's just the way it was. I mean, back then, women didn't women didn't women didn't start working until the forties and fifties, whenever everybody else was overseas fighting the World War II, right? Like, this is thirty years prior to women actually becoming a workforce. Yeah, right, 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 right. So, and again, right, like, but they will basically like, hey, like the the whole goal of his book, he's like, if you've done this right then you will, if you have applied my principles, my four principles appropriately, you will bring science into the conversation. We will develop some, we will develop, use this science to develop better ways of working. And three, it's not just management saying do this and the workmen saying yes, you know, yes, you know, yes, master, right? Like they will Mm -hmm. work together in order to make this happen, right? So at its core, right, it's, it's the same thing with, it's the same thing with the principles of waterfall, right? Like, like the original intention of waterfall was not to create the, the most immense, incredibly terrible phase gated process known to man. That is not the way that waterfall was originally created or, you know, or, or anything else, right? Like the, the, that episode's well, coming up. From, we'll do that episode yeah. next. We're going to dig into Winston Royce's paper on waterfall. Yeah, <clears throat> but continue, yeah. continue. But like, again, like, hey, bring science into the conversation. Use that science to develop a better way of working. Um, it, the, the, the interesting part is, and, and Jay, I don't know if we were going to talk about this later, like he, he doesn't change like the work in this book. Like Taylor didn't change um he didn't like create this change and then say hey everybody fi- everybody must follow this one process and also everybody doesn't have to work the exact same way like he goes person by person mm-hmm. 
de develops their process and then optimizes the processes for that individual worker. Yes. And, and yes. then says, and then says, Hey, if you do this, I'll pay you more money. And they were like, okay, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of them improved kind of a thing, right? Like, yes. Which is funny, which is funny in this world of frameworks and, um, you know, IP that we all have to base our sometimes stupid work some days, right? Like he goes person by person and says, ooh, I see you walking this way. What if you walked that way? Mm -hmm. Hey, you, if you lifted it this way instead of that way, you're your quote you 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 would beat your quota by a like by a leaps and bounds every single day you know yes. this right yes yes i mean it's... That, sorry am i am i am i jumping way too no ahead, no Jay? no 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 I'm, I'm glad you brought that okay. up because it, we'll, we'll, we can talk now about the experiments but i'm going to steal from dave snowden his term in a complex system is the idea of coherent heterogeneity where it's coherent but everything is different right there, there's there's some some of the same um well, so to your point about, you know, learning for each man, one of the, the first experiment that's used in this book, which is the experiment that we talk about the most, is the experiment of pig iron. Again, you're shoveling out of a pile into a wheelbarrow. It's going into a, uh, I had it backwards. It's going into a rail car, which then goes to a smelter. And he experimented with each individual man was given a different size shovel, maybe longer handle, shorter handle, bigger blade, shorter blade. Again, think, think of the shovels, if anybody's ever used like one of those industrial, they sell them at Home Depot in the gardening aisle, those giant scoops. Right. He experimented with shovel size. He experimented with do Chris, Jay and Andrew Leff all share a rail car or do they get dedicated to their own car? We he shared uh, he experimented with, well, how far is Jay versus Chris versus Andrew Leff to the pile of pig iron that has to go into the car? And through experimentation, he learned that each different man could do things a little bit differently. There are certain men who could move more pig iron than others. There are certain that couldn't. And he never, at no point, and here's another important thing that we chuck up to Taylor's, at no point does he attack the people who were less productive. What he actually says is the five or six men who were the most productive, who I've met, who have just get into a groove, they have found their sweet spot with shovel, with distance to the pile, the car, and they can move. We're going to compensate them better because this is just right in their wheelhouse. Not saying that they're better or worse. They get a higher compensation. Well, I mean, to be fair, Jay, did your, uh, did your, did your, uh, I think, can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. Okay. There we go. I don't know. My, my. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you froze up as saying like that every, like basically like, Hey, when they do better, we're going to pay them better. He basically yes. introduced um a financial um incentive he talks about um that uh, i i don't i would be curious to know um what his so all we saw all we see is taylor's work like it's not like it's not like gantz sitting beside him right writing like right. side commentary this is not like the written version of a podcast we only have taylor's perspective so i would be right. curious to know like how were others speaking about incentive around that time i would be curious to know more about like again we have the history that taylor writes again as the mm -hmm. setup for like these are the companies that i worked with this is what they did kind of a thing it's not like there is it's not like hbr is around this time you know to uh <laughs> to uh to talk about uh, yeah. or or uh you know what i, I forget the other tech um, he, tech but blogs he, that are that are he really talks popular. about it, Bourbon. To your point, at the end of the book, the last chunk of the book is yeah. him asking people, "Please stop writing me and telling me you want me to come and study your company. I don't have the, I don't have the time." Right. Also, also, <laughs> do you remember? Um, do you remember that how long he spent? Not, not so. His very first company that he writes about. Do you do you remember how long he spent with them? No. In his initial trans, so the first transformate, you know, quote unquote transformation that's in the again. So you also want to talk uh -huh. about like, hey, wait, this Frederick Taylor is full of crap. Like, mm, hold on a second. Um, <laughs> the there are some things that he does that he that he specifically calls out um, to, um, you know, about like 
his work. Like, do you remember Jay, how long he spent with his first company? It was years, right? It was three years. years. Yeah. Three. It was not a, not a short, you know, he didn't, he didn't see all in. Like he was three, three years. Yeah. Three years. He, he like, it's I was, I, there were a lot of things that he says and some of it was just like how they work and the way, I mean, trust me, like all of you talking about bad management and talking about like, this is what stupid leadership is and such like, trust me, I took tons of the notes in here. Um, I took tons of notes in here where I was basically like making fun of him and how, like how he's writing and, 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 and things of that that nature but he says like he basically says on page 37 after about three years of this kind of struggling the output of the machines had been materially increased and in many cases doubled and as a result the writer had been promoted to one gang boss ship to another until he became foreman of the shop right like he spent three years working on this right again it's the headwind tailwind that we talk about with transformations three to five with the tail five to seven with the head and that's even being overly optimistic right yeah so so uh, yeah. like i i i want to i i want to defend taylor he didn't take the entire group through a giant training exercise and then give them all the same incentive and the tools for the success he took three years to go through every single person who worked there and basically said i'm done we have achieved transformation mm -hmm. like here's the thing we all talk about like true transformation success can't be determined a lot of times like with our work trust me I have talked about that so many times, how like every transformation is relative and no true organization is going to, he actually achieved a hundred percent success in this transformation. Yeah. Like, like now granted were companies different back then. Yes. They, they, they were basically in charge of moving pig iron around so that it could get smelted and reformed into something else. Right. Like I get it, you know, yeah, he wasn't curing cancer. He wasn't doing anything, but like he went in. How many of you could truly say I achieved one hundred percent transformation? Right, and he like, did it in nineteen eleven. Yep, and it's not a freaking group activity. You know what I mean? Like he went person by person. You know, like we want to talk about like how to make transformation. That's my next podcast to do. That's after we, that's after that's, that's the next one you and I need to talk about is how transformation is not a group exercise. It's not a, there is no such thing as a group transformation. Transformation is a one-on-one -on -one exercise, motherfucker. Yeah. Like yeah, that's well, just, a, that's just a fact. And this book proves it. Yeah. We can, we're definitely going to go down that path. So to your point though, about transformation, um, another thing that he lays out that I thought was along these lines of transformation the idea of, he calls it a, a pull system, where you mm -hmm. go from being an apprentice to a worker, to a lead, to a trainer or a teacher, he used mm -hmm. those terms interchangeably, to a manager. So by, by demonstrating uh, aptitude, but also by suggesting improvements, and we're going to talk about the, there's a giant chunk of continuous improvement in this book, we'll talk about that in a minute. But he actually sets the tone and the expectation that, look, as you do this and you get better and you advance, we are going to pull you up into the system. Because you are experienced doing these things, you can lend insight into new ways and means of getting to doing the work, better value, sooner as ever happier. Oh, yeah. This is, yeah, this is turn the ship around type of leadership mm -hmm. that he's talking about, you know? And the, the, I mean, the funny part is, is that management was spoken of as a four letter word, just as much back in 1911 as it is now, you yeah. know what I mean? Like there's yep. some things that truly never go away and maybe why some of the criticism over management is just genetic as homo it's sapiens. A, yes. You know what I mean? Like yes. maybe that's so for the record, like before you knocked you know, go any further through this note of Taylorism, right? Like we don't think of Taylorism as what it is. We think about it as far as like, pick any framework, trust me, any framework. I hear people make fun of Kanban all the time. Like, trust me, 
like every framework is talked about in the way that, you know, that bad mm-hmm. management, bad leadership back in night, you know, back in the early 1900s, the late yep. 1800s, like bosses sucked back then. And maybe they're just going to always, I've been a boss. I'm sure I've sucked sometimes. Yes. Yes. I, I you know what I mean. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I suck at my job. Um. So to your point though, to your point, we're, we're humans. That's why this problem keeps coming up. We are, I'm going to quote myself, we are fighting biology, right? This is just the way we are programmed. Um, so to your point, though, about we're fighting biology, we're humans, this has existed all throughout time. If you, it's like some of the concepts that come in, that come up in this book that aren't called these things, but they should be familiar to all of us. The idea of work in progress, right? There was that experiment he talked about, about, my God, this is, this is the most unsexy part of the book, where he talked about Merman, the ball bearing inspectors. And I, oh my God, I, that was that was a tough point. But he reduced their workday. He introduced mandatory mm-hmm. breaks. Like he limited the amount of work that they can work on simultaneously. That's WIP, right? Managing work in progress, which also is the idea of uh, uh you know resource. Uh, Johanna, shout out to Johanna Rothman. Resource, so, resource efficient. Go on, go on, go on. Yeah, no, 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 no. I to to tag on to what you're saying. Like he 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 says he says. Um, we failed, therefore, to find any law which was an accurate guide to the maximum day's work for a first class workman. You know what I mean? Like, so, like, you want to talk about like success? Like, they, there are all of these ways of working, these rules of thumb. Like, they tried to find laws for the ways that any of them did something and they couldn't do it. Now, which is funny is, is, <laughs> uh so basically taylor is saying trust science yeah. i'm waiting for the start i'm waiting for uh, the smart ass response I mean, from you I mean, jay it's he's not wrong he's not wrong and again <laughs> I, I can't i dave i just have dave's note in the back of my head saying um of course scientific management works what other kind of management is there right so i mean whatever whatever but you're right though but that's right. the way his only his that's the way his, i know it's his brain, his brain can um, function but, i'm not that smart but to your point, right? So the science behind WIP, um, he talks about uh, resource efficiency versus flow efficiency, right? High utilization rate leads to slowdown in the process. He had a giant chunk in his experiments with the bricklayers specifically around definition of ready, where where the mortar board is, what brick, where the bricks are laid out, how big the piles are. Like the work was ready. So the, so I you literally pick up the brick with your left hand, the the, the mortar with your right hand, Travel wall like that's definition of ready. He, he there's a huge chunk about waste elimination, right? Re- removing unnecessary movements, removing unnecessary steps. That's that's lean. And, and and again, here we are shitting on Taylorism as 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 a as an agile oh. collective by and large. And he has a ginormous chunk of this book, a good ten. Uh, it was ten. It's ten paragraphs, probably. It's like three or four pages on the idea of continuous improvement. All right, so like, uh, let me let me play cynic for just a moment. Let me let me read. I I I summer. I highlighted this one sentence, and I wanted to know what this sounds like to you, right? So, to summarize, under the management of initiative and incentive, practically the whole problem is up to the workman, while under scientific management, fully one half the problem is quote up to the management. So. I now let me maybe I tell me what that sounds like to you because it sounds to me like what he's saying is, or it sounds to me like he's saying hey y'all aren't smart enough to to handle this so you need to kind of listen to us because um, we're kind of smarter than you now now maybe one way. this erudite method of writing from those days maybe could be coloring my reading of his words but that's how they read to me that that's one way to interpret it. I mean, I also think another way to interpret it would is his he's making the point of it shouldn't just be up to you to solve all your problems and do your work. We should be there to support you. So I mean, yeah. they're both true. The both statements, your statement and mine, are, are both true. And I mean, if he was alive, we could probably bring him up and ask him. But I think there's the truth. Probably Merman. He probably wrote it from somewhere in the middle. To be if we're well, being realistic. Also, also, also. This, um, again, while there's truly nothing new under the sun, you, you know, we, we love talking, especially um, 
uh, in the sports world, we love to talk about how the nerds have taken over and it's, you know, there's all this sports Billy science Bean. behind yep. it. Well, not just money ball, but also the new statistics of the way that, I don't know if you're an NBA fan, but the NBA is not played the same way today as it was once upon a time. Mm-mm. Um, back when we were, we taught, you know, and because science has been kind of optim, have kind of optimized things like baseball and, you know, and basketball and football slow, you know, coming around as well with statistical revolution, like Taylor's kind of a fish out of water in his sense with this book. I mean, he's, this dude's a nerd. Like this dude yes. is not yes. a this d- dude is not a sloped for a knuckle dragger. Like he he went to one of them fancy schools, if you mm-hmm. will. Um, and he's talking to a bunch of dudes that most of them sign their name with an X. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. So all right. So again, if we asked him what he thought, he is uh kind of like if you decide to sass talk uh the at the the in in-house agilist at your company um mm-hmm. you would probably get talked to the same way that jay and i would be about hey do, do you think you're smarter than us and he'd be like actually i do i know i do <laughs> but then again that was a different day and yeah. at the same time it's not a different day because there are things that happen as you read this book. I'm like, oh, that still happens. Oh, that thing that he says that scientific management right. is here to fix. Right. Oh, no, so that, that's that old for that old way of management still happens. Seriously, Bourbon, how many times do you think this guy actually got hit by a shovel? Like, how many times was he sitting there lecturing some guy throwing pig iron around? Uh, and the guy just one, turned and clanged him on. One, one could, one could meant to say that, um, he like all of this like scientific like how people's paid i'm sure he found a way to get extra money put in so that he could have his shoes shined before he went home for dinner because god forbid his wife think yeah. that he worked for a living you yeah. know yeah he's but, definitely uh, the precursor to what we call today's professional managerial class but again Absolutely. but again but again but again while he would say of course i'm smarter than you how many times have you and I sat across the table from one of these slope yep. forehead, knuckle dragging, waterfall thinking, uh, yep. you know, Philistines and looked down our nose at them and said, I need to have my shoes shined before I go back to where the cool agile kids are after talking to yeah. such a Luddite as yourself. Stop me if you've heard this before, folks. We tend to, as a community, be a little egotistical Snobbish. and yes. um uh in need of the in need of a kick in uh whatever the junk means to you maybe it's your ego but like we need to be a little more humble you know because yeah. we have the same problem that taylor was trying to deal with for the record taylor is the agilist of the 1911 <laughs> he is he is. He really is. Um, and so- yet we make fun <laughs> of Taylor and his writing. And for the record, his writing is a little dark and but it's not. It's and it's a little all the time. He, he didn't think that the people he was transforming were going to ever read this. Right. And again, he was a mechanical engineer by trade. So everything was written out in triplicate. Like so let's let's take it <laughs> home with. Let's take it home with uh, one of the quotes that came out of the book that I actually put put as my last bullet because I thought this was really impressive and very indicative of the struggles we go through. You want to call him the OG Agilist. He has a quote where he says, the best mechanism for applying these general principles should in no way be confused with the principles themselves. So don't mix up the principles with the commonly accepted behaviors, practices, and frameworks that were built as an abstraction off of the principles. Everybody hit pause, take 90 seconds to ruminate on that, and then hit play again, and we'll come back to it. <laughs> uh, uh, even better, as I was reading the very end of the, like the very end of the the afterward part, um, 
there there's a note in here that socialists lambasted Taylor's process because more capital is the primary motivation for making people work harder, faster, longer on one certain task. His process would reduce the worker's capacity for learning other skills that could make him more valuable. Also, by viewing the workers as cogs in a machine, it reduced social benefits and values. And for the record, many of you are talking about your management and leaders the exact same way. Yep. Yep. And, and so somebody again, missed the point nothing's about changed. Because he talks about, you know, the idea of the what did he say? The worker uh, workers should be able to use their originality and ingenuity to make real addition to the world's knowledge instead of reinventing things that are old. And mm. here we are. Fre mm. So Frederick mm. Tara Wilson, mm. you, when there is the agile Mount Rushmore, um, along with the snowbird guys, he goes up there. He goes up there. Uh for the most part. Yeah. Well, at least in spirit. I'm putting them up there. I'm putting them up there. And I know I, Troy's going to try are, and put Dr. There Lewis are up some there things well. there are some things in here that you just best not look down your nose at and maybe we should try some of these things. I don't always like the way he did it, but there is definitely some meat on this bone. Yeah. Yep. Um, so tune in next week as we decompose Dr. Winston Royce's paper on uh, managing the development of large software systems. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, I think this is turning into a bit of a theme here because I know Troy just did a show where he talks about Dr. John Little and Little's Law. And we're talking about Taylorism. We are going to talk about Winston Royce. Um, I did actually, I added to my Amazon cart some of the things that were actually referenced in this book. He references a guy by the name of, what's his name? Uh, Henry Fayol, Fayol. Henri Fayol, General and Industrial Management. Uh, I threw that in my Amazon card to pick up because, I, again, if everything is going home all in circles, uh, some of that old stuff is worthwhile knowing. So uh, uh, let me ask you this, Robert, before I close this out. Um, was this worth the time it took to read it? Did you get something out of it? Was it, was it something you would do again? Oh, well, I not, only did I, not only did I, did I enjoy reading this did i get something out of this i i texted this to you a couple weeks ago when i was going through the book i was basically like i've just turned my my kindle notes you know where you can like highlight it and then make a note about the passage that you highlighted that's why I, if i'm doing something reading for professional work i love doing it on kindle because i love taking the notes anyways um it was basically like having a conversation with you, like all the notes that I was taking, like it was really fun to do this like one-on-one -on -one thing because then you and I could like banter while we're doing it, um, uh, even though banter is only interesting to you and I, but I, I enjoyed, if you, if you are interested in this, like pick somebody that's kind of similarly um, sense of humored uh as as you are because you can basically just make notes and like just talk to each other and it's it's really it's really enjoyable awesome awesome and with that uh everybody check out the principles of scientific management by frederick winslow taylor i uh, hope you enjoyed the conversation there's more in this series soon so until next time this is the agile uprising podcast signing out cheers later